was born in Newport News, Virginia, and I grew up in Fairfax, Virginia, which is sort of northern Virginia, right outside Washington, D.C. Right. Um, I went to the University of Illinois uh, for my bachelor's degree in music, and then Temple University for a, a master's in Philadelphia. And that was basically to study with uh, Alan Abel. He, he was the former associate principal percussionist in the Philadelphia Orchestra. He was probably the person that had probably the biggest influence on me doing, being in the orchestra at least. Um, and just my, my passion for playing in an orchestra and being a classical percussionist was uh, this man. And so he was, to, to, in order to study with him, you had to go get a master's at Temple. And then after that, I spent uh, three years in the New World Symphony down in South Beach, Miami. For three years, and then uh, I mean, I freelanced around South Florida after that before I got this job. But I played with the Naples Philharmonic over in Naples, Florida for a while, couple years. They used to have, when you were a grad student there, they used to kind of have a system where you'd end up playing there um, like one time, but uh, they, they stopped doing that maybe like two years before I got there, which was 92 was when I started, 92 to 94, I was there for two years. And uh, they had actually just, uh, they had invited me to come play this year because of the situation with the lockout here. Um, but it, I, don't, I was gone so much, I just ended up just saying I, I, I couldn't make it, I wanted to be here. You know, Naples has one percussionist in the orchestra. The, that, that orchestra, uh, it's fairly unique in the country. Um, I mean, it, the, it's a fairly successful orchestra f uh, for the way they're structured. They have a very small core that, that, um, that gets paid fairly well, and then, the, and then the rest of the orchestra is supplemented by freelancers. and. Uh, so I was, you know, at the time that I was there, that was where I made most of um, my money was playing with them. Uh, but also just, uh, you know, the Southwest Florida Orchestra and just doing church jobs. And uh, when we first got out of New World, my wife and I, I mean, just to make a living, we were, we both worked at the city of North Miami Beach. I took the, um, I took the census for North Miami one year. and. <laughs> You know, my wife was like a giant crayon for, uh, I don't know if it was for Michael's, but some, some sort of like Michael's equivalent um, store. So we did all sorts of, you know, what do you have to do to pay the bills? Um, so I was there for a couple of years and then auditioned for this job and was lucky enough to get it. So that was 90, 1999. Normally for an audition in an orchestra, it's like a very specific, you know, section percussion or you know, section violin or assistant principal clarinet. And I mean, sometimes people might move up if they take another audition, but that was specifically for principal. I mean, like all auditions, <laughs> sort of, uh, they're, they're a very difficult, um, you know, it's a very difficult, challenging procedure to, to go through. And a, not the greatest process, I think, to, to pick someone. Um, but you, you know, there's an, a, an ad put in the paper, and then uh, you get sent a list that has a specific, you know, play all these pieces, and and then you show up to the audition, and there's several rounds to an audition, um, and it's most of them are generally behind a screen, and they, you know, the rounds, the rounds whittle the process, you know, whittle the numbers down, and you know, they might get 300 applicants, and they might hear. 60, 70, you know, of them, and it gets whittled down to then a handful of people. And one thing that they do here, which I, I do think is kind of good, uh, I think it's got its um, benefits, is they, a lot of times, unless it's really super clear, um, they whittle it down to three people or two people, and then they have those two people or three people come and play a couple weeks with the orchestra. Um, before they actually make a decision. And so, I mean, it's still all very artificial. I mean, the audition process is, itself is very artificial. I find it to be artificial, at least. It's a, it's a, 
you know, when you you play, I mean, you play more things in in a, in a way that you know when you're playing for your by yourself on a stage, behind a screen. It's it's unlike the process of making music with people on stage on a daily basis. Um, but I don't really know of any other way to do it. I mean, if I, I wouldn't have gotten my job here, I mean, you know, unless unless you know people in an orchestra and you've got connections, I don't know what other way there is to have an audition and choose somebody. So it's not great, but it's the only one we've got. And so, um, like I say, I, I played here for a couple of weeks. A couple other people played for a couple of weeks. And then, uh, you know, th thankfully, um, I was offered the job. For percussion, I mean, it's generally... Um, there's a, a pretty standard set of things that you have to play, like you might play Porgy and Bess, you know, on the xylophone, the opening to Porgy and Bess, or um, when there's, like on percussion, you're going to play xylophone excerpts, glockenspiel excerpts, you know, I might play like Bolero, Lieutenant Kiji, Scheherazade, that kind of stuff. Um, on snare drum, tambourine, bass drum, you normally have to play a marimba solo. Here it was, uh, um, you know, sometimes people want to hear like a, a contemporary, uh, some piece of contemporary music on marimba or some sort of four mallet solo. Here, here it was uh, just a solo of your choice, so I played some Bach on marimba. Um, I played a beret from the sonata and uh, sonatas and partitas. And, uh, yeah, and I mean, the, the weird thing about, about this place, which I've never had before, was uh, Yoel Levy was the music director at the time, and so he, in the finals, he, the music directors normally don't show up till the finals, because they've got more important things to do with their time. Um, but he, he ended up conducting uh, pretty much almost everything I played, so, you know, he'd be conducting me with Bolero and Porgy and Bess, and conducting along to Romeo and Juliet on the cymbals, which... You know, it was a little unusual, but um, probably a good way just to, to see if somebody knows how to, like, you know, play and follow. I mean, as a percussionist, the one interesting thing about percussion that really probably no one else deals with is that I don't, I don't have physical contact with my instrument, um, you know, when it comes to playing snare drum or xylophone. So you really, like, have to be uh, visually in touch with it in a way that... You know, like a violinist might not have to be. So, um, I've always found having a contact with the with the conductor and being able to watch them and play and and listen, you know, is is, is a a challenging thing to do. But I've never had that happen before at any other audition. But. I mean, when you have an excerpt, I mean, you only, it's like okay, we're gonna hear Romeo and Juliet, and it's like it's ten measures. I mean, yeah. So you might just you know go and start you right at that started at 10 measures and he's not like conducting through a lot of where you're you know a lot of rest or anything yeah but i mean like porgy and bass you know um i mean the weird thing about when you play something like porgy and bass is like when it starts off like right it's got this crazy xylophone part and when it starts off there's just like this this trill that goes on for two measures and so there's no there's really no beat that's established before you you play that so you really are having to watch and then, you know, and get the beat from the conductor. And then once it starts, especially here uh, in Atlanta, we, I, I think we have, like, I'm always complaining about it, but we have probably one of the largest halls in the, in the country. I mean, whenever I go somewhere else, I'm just always shocked at how, how like, com compact the orchestra sits because we have so much real estate on that stage. So, uh, you know, the violins are, like, way in, in front. So when they play... Um, I mean, it's constantly an issue with, with us as percussionists that whatever we do is going to be late because whatever you, if you're playing with what you hear, it's going to be late just from the uh, physical, you know, the acoustic properties of, of how far back we are. And so um, it's really a challenge to like, to, uh, to play ahead of what you're, of constantly, you, you know, you're constantly playing in this where it just feels, uh, you know, blurry or it, it feels, if it feels uncomfortable, most likely it's it's right but some people are some conductors are really sticklers about it and like Yoel Levy in particular was I mean he was like a taskmaster about you had to play right with where his his where you saw his beat not with where you heard his beat so he was um, 
I think that was something that he was very particular about, was finding somebody that would follow him right along with where he was. But, you know, when you're playing something like Porgy and Bess uh, and you're playing with the violins, they're so far in front of you that, you know, it, like I can't, it's hard to even hear them. But if you could hear them and you're playing with them, that's most likely wrong. You know, so, um, and it tends to like, that piece in particular, uh, I don't know if it's just from the, the technical uh, difficulty of their own part, but it, the beat of it tends to ebb and flow a little bit. So you really have to, like, you can't just kind of bury your head in the xylophone and do your thing and then stop and look up and, you know, and know, like, well, I, I know my time's going to be good. So you just, you know, you really have to be like, um, staying connected visually and, and, uh, you know, just uh, listening to what what's going on, but also visually f checking in to see, like, man, is this, you know, am I in the right, am I staying with what's going on here? But I, I find on our stage it to be extremely, extremely challenging because it's so big and because there's so much, like it used to be when we had the older shell, um, it, it was it was such a piece of garbage. Like we, we eventually had to replace the shell because somebody came in and said this shell is going to fall on somebody and it's going to kill somebody. And so, obviously, we don't want to kill anybody. But obviously, you know, from a like liability standpoint, they couldn't have that. So we got this new shell, and it's able to move around a little bit easy, more easily. So we shrink the the, the stage down when we can, when there's a, like a more normal, like if we're doing a Mahler symphony, we have to push it back as far as we can. Or if the chorus is there, we push it back as far as we can. But if we're just doing like a normal size orchestra, we can get rid of like one segment of it and it squeezes us together a little bit. But even that is still, you know, like when we go to Carnegie Hall, I mean, it feels like it's half the size of what our stage is here. But you know, the, the, just the, the gentleness of the sound in there, it, it makes it easier. Like, the size of our stage and the size of the auditorium, you just got to put out a lot of sound for it to fill things up. So when you're, when you're jammed on top of each other, it, it can just get quite loud. And so when I'm, you know, when I'm playing and trying to do my best to play well, then you get, you know, you get lots of scowls and, um, you know, sound shields going up from your, the colleagues on stage. So. Or like when I've played in Cleveland a couple of times, it's like you just don't have to exert much effort to get like a very big, full sound. Whereas here, you, you, you really kind of do just to, to fill up the, 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 the space that we have. You know, I got asked to go play in other places and that was just the one thing I was just always shocked at, just like how close I felt to the uh, music director, to the front violins, because it just, it's not very deep. And I remember in, in St. Louis in particular, just playing things there. And, you're, you know, you're just hitting a note on a, whatever, a set of chimes or something. And it's just like what I would consider like a medium, you know, a mezzo forte sound um, here was easily like as loud as, I, you know, it was like my forte or fortissimo sound there. Yeah, I mean, you, I, I think you don't have to play... Uh, you don't have to play on on top of things as much, but um, you know, in Cleveland, I mean, again, it was just so I just it's so small there, and and you're right on top of each other, but again, you don't you're not having to like make as much volume, so I don't I, I think people are able to deal with it. Um, I, I think volume is a, is an issue everywhere. You know, people yeah. have earplugs and sound shields, and some places deal with it differently than others, but. Um, this is a kind of a consistently loud place to, to play. And some orchestras, I think, play louder than, than other orchestras are just kind of known for, known for that. But, um, but yeah, for sure, I've just noticed that it wasn't as big of an issue. Um, and, you know, and here, I, sometimes we, I think we can get lazy or, I mean, personally, um, we can get lazy in where we're placing the beat. And, but, you know, in some orchestras, uh, some conductors, are really on top of it that really insist that you know like I say Levy was like the master of that um, 
but it, it really can it really is quite uncomfortable to play where we where we have to play with how far back we are and I mean I don't think most people even even realize that but I know it's I still I'll go out all the time and you think like I've been here 16 years you'd think like you know I've mastered it at this point but it's just it, it's just like it's always different if, if you're playing something that's just with the first violins then you really need to like anticipate with what you're hearing if it's if the whole orchestra is playing something, then then it's or if you're playing something that's like with just the French horns, then you're pretty safe to play with what you're hearing. Um, or if it's with the uh, like a the entire orchestra, I feel like you can kind of just go with what you're hearing. But um, if it's something with the basses or the you know the cellos, um, yeah, you really have to anticipate. I I could go up to somebody else in the section and say, this sounds, you know, you sound late. Whereas, like, if somebody else in the section, as a principal, were to come up to me and say, hey, you sound late on this, like, that might not be kosher, but, <laughs> I mean, we don't really, we don't really operate that way. I don't, I don't operate that way, and I mean, I res respect my Bill and Charles, you know, immensely, and I mean, I might, we might go and, and uh, I, I, I like to view it as a, a lot more uh, collaborative than that. I, I mean, I, I work hard to find the balance between stuff that's, um, you know, kind of thorny or, or challenging to listen to, but uh, but that's also accessible. I mean, it, it's, it's it's always amazing to me that just as a piece of music, I mean, even stuff that I really like, it's like I might have heard it, you know, 20 times and. Uh, and maybe the first time you hear something, you don't don't really appreciate it. And most of the things that we play are people have never going to heard before. And um, and so that's difficult to like really be turned on by something that you just hear one time. But um, so yeah, it, it's it's hard to find stuff that I think uh, that's a good balance between all that. But it's a nice outlet. It's a fun thing to. do. Uh, I mean, so I, I started off as, um, I used to play like in, I, it was more like, uh, I was really into skateboarding, so it was like skate punk. Um, there was a really great uh, punk rock scene in D.C. when I was in the 80s, so I was, I was really into that as a kid. I did that for a while. I was in a reggae band for a while, but I've never been a big uh, pop music person as far as like, uh, when I say that, I guess I mean like, stuff that would have been on like MTV or you know like 80s 90s pop but um, I certainly like plenty of pop music but I don't know that's a big category that a lot of music gets fit into yeah I mean I was kind of late in getting into into I didn't I didn't really even play with an orchestra until I was about halfway through college I mean and I wasn't I didn't grow up listening to uh, classical music I mean my dad was a drummer as a kid my his his mother was a I guess you'd define her as kind of an entertainer, a jazz pianist, singer, and um, and he sort of, uh, I guess he was more of an amateur musician, but he um, he used to perform with her, and so, I mean, his drums were just around the house, in the garage, and whatnot, um, and my brother played the drum. We both played in the marching band, the symphonic band. So, I mean, I guess if you, I mean, I was into that, I was into the marching band, and and uh, which I guess is still, you know, classical. I mean, classical music in a lot of ways. But as far as the orchestra music, I mean, I never, I never, I wasn't in like a youth orchestra or didn't play with my first orchestra really till I went to the Aspen Music Festival. Um, like, I don't know, maybe before, after 10th grade, I, I think, is when I started that. I like John Adams a lot, actually, and I've, I've been really, um, that's one thing that's been, I think, great about at least my uh, the first ten years or so here. They've really scaled things back here, but the first like ten years here, I just thought were fantastic. I mean, we played so much of his music and and, and stuff that's you know big that it's kind of hard to program. You know, Doctor Atomic or El Nino. Um, I just I I really like the way he writes for percussion. Um, I mean, I like Stravinsky a lot, but yeah, I also, I also like uh, I like Sariajo's music a lot. And I wish we we did more more things by her, but um, I don't. I, it, it really is such a great time, um, and there's so many. Uh, I actually think for for a percussionist, there's probably more interesting things going on in the uh, 
for chamber music and solo music. Like, I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of uh, David Lang, and um, I mean, he, he's got uh, some things for orchestra, but not not a ton. I mean, I, I think the stuff that's really great of his is more chamber chamber oriented. Um, but a lot of the stuff that's really interesting out there now is, is more solo chamber chamber music. I, I find a lot of the, the new orchestra stuff, um, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's not as interesting to me. And a lot of people approach, I don't know, when, they, when they're writing for percussion nowadays and for the orchestra, it's just, it's so huge, you know, and they use like everything that, that they can. Um, I mean, if you do something like, uh, by like uh, Carigliano, I mean, it's just like, I know it's going to be like a. He's going. We're going to use everything we've got, and uh, I'm, I, I always. I kind of. Not that that's bad. I mean, he's got lots of great pieces we've played, but I tend to like stuff that's kind of a smaller, written for a smaller number of instruments, but that's used really effectively, written really well. Um, but yeah, the, the chamber music stuff, you know, the stuff that Sonic does, I mean, I find a lot more people that, like, I'm really turned on to, but that are just maybe some guy that's, like, you know, maybe they're making a living being a composer or not, um, as opposed to John Adams. Um, but I do, I mean, I think as far as, like, you know, or Esa Pegasalan, I think the way he writes is, is really fantastic, uh, for percussion especially, but... Um, but yeah, I think John's, John's music is great. We're doing... Scheherazade 2.0 in a couple right. of months or something. I'm really looking forward to that. The problem here uh, for us is we normally get we normally get the people that are that there's a buzz about before they get um, before they've gone everywhere else. And then so like I remember like probably one guy that I really liked was uh, um, Petrenko. I thought he was great. And, uh, and he came back, but then, you know, there's only so many, you know, those, these guys, and they get a, they get a job somewhere in a, in a decent orchestra, and then, but then, and then their calendar gets filled up with, you know, then they'll be in San Francisco, you know, every year, or at New York, or we just don't pay, you know, what San Francisco is going to pay, or L.A. is going to pay, and when you, when, you know, when you've got, okay, can I go here, can I go there, you're going to go there.